All right, everyone, thanks for cruising with the change. Change is the only constant. All right, we'll get started. We are going to be on page 72 today in your lab notes. I like having new perspective. I'm seeing new faces up here. This is fun. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. What the ocean realm re reveals about the health of Earth is what we're going to dive into today. I just read in the uh, Penn State Newswire that today is World Mental Health Day. So we should open with our, our breathing activity. And today we're going to think about our breath as the ebb and the flow, just like the ebb and the flow of the waves of the ocean. Sometimes they come, those breaths come fast and rapid if we're nervous or anxious about something, just like sometimes during a storm and upheaval, the waves change their intensity. We too change in intensity and change in our flow. So take a moment with your feet on the ground, feel real like grounded in your seats. Take a couple of deep breaths. It's good for our whole bodies, including our mental health. It's also Indigenous Peoples Day, so we can celebrate other, the cultures of people that were here before us. And so that's a fun and important thing to honor as well. This week, your assignment in your journal is going to be to create a, a concept map. You're going to be reading chapter five of the text and putting together all the pieces kind of like this as a map. Um, so getting the, the main ideas. So the topic, the main idea of this one is human exploration and then drawing all the arrows and making connections, potentially using different colors. This is probably more like what yours is going to look like. So it asks you to tape three pieces of paper together, and then you'll be attaching that, including that in your journal for your TA this week. Um, this person chose, did choose to use some different colors to signify different connections or strength of connections or whatever might be important or drawing out. So trying to get as many, pull as many pieces as you can from that chapter five to put into your concept map. You'll bring those with you to lab and that will be a main topic of, of what you're gonna talk about and do in lab this week, um, is understanding these kinds of connections. Don't forget to use all of your cool equipment, you know? where there, you, you feel like there isn't a direct connection, but like there's something that tells you that there is connection, like use your gut, use your heart. All of those pieces go into your concept map. All right, and don't forget that this week is also your pack pack assignment makeup time, started this morning at eight. Any, ref, any of your original reflections or responses to other people, um, you can do those and they'll be counted in your final grade doing them this week. So that's there for you as well. So then coming to think about the ocean, this magnificent picture titled Earthrise, was taken by William Anders in December of 1968. The first view of Earth from the moon the blue planet, all the oceans, all the waters that we have here. So thinking about that ebb and flow of the ocean, the waves in and out, just as our breath goes in and out, those rhythm, the rhythms of our lives, the rhythms of our planets. Um, I'd like you to consider this question. What is your relationship with the ocean? 
How do you feel about the ocean? So take a minute and consider quietly, introspectively, and then talk about it with your neighbor when you're both ready. I would love to hear from some of you. What is your relationship to the ocean? Um, I like the water to a certain extent. After a certain point, it gets kind of creepy because we don't know, it, like, we only know like a small fraction of the water. So like the way my brain processes it is like, we don't know what's under there, even though they say like there might not be much under there, but I think that there's probably like a whole nother thing going on down there that we don't know about. And the reason why it's so easy to hide it is because like it gets really cold to a certain point. And yeah. it's like the air pressure is just too much for us to be able to explore down there and our technology isn't that advanced, so. Yeah, so it's mysterious, right? Yeah, what else? Um, personally, me, yeah, I'm not doing that. Oh, I'm not <laughs> going down in the ocean with no gas mask on. Uh -huh. I mean, not gas mask, oxygen mask with a flashlight. No, I'm not. Because <laughs> it's a certain point where your flashlight doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And a sure. shark is not going to get me. <laughs> We're not doing that. We're not doing that. That's right. 97% of the water on the planet is found in the ocean because of those crazy depths right? Yeah. Other comments? How do you feel about the ocean? What's your relationship with the ocean? So there's mystery, there's fear. Um, I was just going to say I kind of have a different perspective on this because I grew up always going to the ocean as a kid. Uh -huh. And even when I was like really little, I would like swim out really far for like junior lifeguards and stuff. So I never really thought about the fear that I would develop and I never did. So uh -huh. I think a lot of people like are super afraid of the ocean. And for me, I, there was something I was very conditioned to enjoy and like feel peaceful about. And even thinking about what's underneath me, it's just kind of like instead of it being like mysterious or scary, I think of it as like really cool and like amazing. Mm, and interesting. I don't know, even with like diving and stuff, that's something that I've like had the privilege of doing as well. And like, um, I've been able to like experience what's underneath. And I think that also eases up some fear to like know kind of. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, thank you. It sounds like you have a real connection, real relationship, that's cool. Um, I'm from Florida, and so I've grown up going to the beach a lot. I'm also a scuba diver, so I've been in like pitch black water, um, been scared under like at night on dives, and just like kind of getting uncomfortable has made me more comfortable with the fact that we don't know what's in the ocean, and it's really allowed me to be like more curious and want to know what's more about like going on in our ocean. So I've done a lot of like plastic research, um, and like it's sad to see what's going on, but I think like that connection and getting uncomfortable has really allowed me to be more curious and get a better understanding of what's going on in our oceans. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, personally, I love the ocean. I go to the Outer Banks every year with my family, 
and I love like boogie boarding out in the ocean or just like jumping in the waves. So it's always been like something that I just find really relaxing and fun. Sweet. Thanks for sharing. I love the variety of the yeah perspectives. Is this on? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I live at the ocean. I've lived there since I was like I don't know, five or something like that. Um, I'm from North Carolina. Live right on the water. Um, I love the beach. I'm there every day. I'm a surf instructor in the summers. Um, yeah, surfing's great. I always get there, get the early morning surf before all the tourists come and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I'm in love with the water, love with the beach, love with the ocean. Um, yeah. Fishermen use it. They feed the local restaurants and stuff like that with the fish that they catch right there off the water. So, I mean, you know, I have a big relationship with the ocean and, you know, everybody in our small town does. So, you know, yeah. yeah, really important to us. And, you know, when people don't take care of it, it kind of hurts us, kind of makes us upset. So, you know, yeah. we all spend our time there. We're all on boats. We're all in kayaks or we're out there surfing or swimming. So, yeah. And I don't know, it's kind of funny, like, when people are, like, afraid of the ocean because, you know, they're not from here. You know, they're usually from, like, like tourists that we get there all the time. They're either from, like, PA or Michigan or whatever. And so they're like, I don't know how to swim or, you know, I don't know what this, like, ocean thing is called or what's this thing in the water or whatever you know what I mean and so it's kind of funny um, we always make fun of those people we call them kooks but um, yeah we love it um, you know surfing's great and you know people try and get out there and they get all nervous and stuff but you know it's pretty fun you just got to send it and try not to be afraid of the water so yeah it's all about different experiences because those of us who have grown up and lived and raised been raised in the mountains that might be an uncomfortable place for some other people and so learning and, and appreciating different perspectives. Yes. I have a blend of a fascination of the ocean. I'm not interested enough to know like what's in there. Like I don't I don't really I've never really been interested in studying it. Like when I'm in an academic setting, I've always felt like, oh, I'm more interested in what's in space if I had to choose a different environment from the land, but when I see it in person, it's it can be very beautiful. There's a great kind of draw to it and allure, um, but there's also this uh, humbling fear when you see the ocean because of its vastness, its power. You know, um, you're not entirely in control when you are involved in it, and I think um, that that's really the case in a lot of of a lot of different like places in our life. Mm -hmm. um, if we leave, say, the confides of our own home, we're not really in absolute control of the environment. But the ocean especially is um, really an outlet that removes you from most of the uh, comforts of uh, man-made, human-made society. Yeah, thank you. So many different perspectives. I appreciate all of those. That's interesting. Just different experiences lead us to different emotions, right? Different connections. Um, these people, the Polynesian people, uh, that set out to find other lands, um, knowing the ocean in a very intimate way. They would put their children in tide pools from very young ages to sense the flow uh, and ebb of the ocean so that when they grew up, they could read the ocean in ways that I, and having sensitivities that that I can't imagine. So the way that refraction patterns of waves, as the wave comes toward an island, and then it goes around, so to speak, it creates these patterns of waves. And that's what they used in order to sense whether they were going the right direction to finding new places to live. So they were doing this, they were using the stars, they were navigating by all of these different sensitivities than definitely than what I have. Um, and even for those of you who love the ocean, this is probably, could be a very foreign way of thinking. Um, but how things change over time, right? Our, our different sensitivities, our different awarenesses um, to the ocean. This woman, Sylvia Earle, um, she is National Geographic's oceanographer, um, head oceanographer. Even if you never have the chance to see or to touch the ocean, the ocean touches you with every breath you take, every drop of water you drink, every bite of food you consume. She came to speak here in March of 2020, just before the pandemic started, and, um, and I got to hear her speak actually in this room. And she changed my view. She changed my perspective 
on what's happening with the oceans. She is so beautifully connected. Like, I love the ocean, but this woman is intensely connected to it. She has an understanding and innate of that innate intelligence of what's happening with the ocean. So the way that we often look at our globe or the world map looks like this. And we separate all the oceans out, you know, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean. This is sometimes the Arctic, you know. So it, but then if we look at it like this, like the Pacific Ocean, it's all connected. It's all water that's connected, covering 71% of our planet with, as I said, 97% of the water because of the depths that are, are in the ocean, sometimes two miles deep in the water. And the ocean is 99% of the biosphere, the things that live in the ocean. There's more things living in the ocean than on land because there is so much more capacity, right? so much more habitat. So then we start to think about what lives under the ocean. These were pictures were taken by a friend of mine who was living in Hawaii at the time and sending me pictures of his dives, the white tip reef, reef shark, the eagle rays. And so even below what we can do as diving, as, as alluded to before, we can't go down very deep, right? Because the pressure becomes too great, we can't survive. And so to get somewhat deeper for our explorations, they can take these submersibles down into the ocean. And some t the deep sea creatures have been found even 11,500 feet down in the ocean. That's like two miles, over two miles down in the ocean. So the way that they explore these things, and they must have a real calling. I mean, thinking about people that are, are loving the ocean, but then people that are being called to study what's there and how it's working. Um, we can get these pretty crazy, crazy contraptions that can go down even deeper so that our pressure, you know, we can survive as humans as we go down in these kind of submersibles. So then the views down there are pretty crazy. Some amazing stuff going on down there under the ocean. These huge schools of huge fish. But then there's also the other side of this. Can you play the embedded video in this slide, please? Thank you. like stuff of the imagination, right? Crazy stuff. It, even at 500 feet down, it is so, so dark, and the pressure is enormous. So the creatures that are living down there, they don't have the typical swim bladders that are found in fish that live closer to the surface. There are also crabs and worms and limpets and clams and just octopus, so many different things living down there. So for 4.5 billion years, the ocean has defined the planet in many ways. All of the life that's in the ocean, from those microbes to the phytoplankton and the fish, and then up to the whales, it's like an orchestra playing away, like all of those melodies, all of those lives intertwined 
in such a beautiful way. It's been the stabilizing factor for all of our planet, really, the ocean. And so today, though, things have shifted, and it's humans. Humans, we are the ones defining the ocean, and what we are creating there is a real discord in the orchestra that's playing. So these natural currents of, er of the, the way the water is flowing according to temperatures and air currents, cold currents and warm currents are moving in circles. They're called gyres. And these illustrate the major gyres of the planet. So the way that, that our weather changes according to the patterns of what's happening with the air currents and the ocean currents and the temperatures. So they act, the ocean currents act as conveyor belts of warm and cold air, sending the, the weather systems around. And so as we know now, right, we've been thinking about particularly what's happening in the North Atlantic with the weather systems, namely the hurricanes that are building and, and doing their destruction. So the ocean currents are doing other things too. They're gathering, they're gathering garbage is what's happening. In these, um, this is the one that's happening in the North Pacific. Um, so there are two, the way that the water is flowing is creating these ocean currents that gather the garbage in these giant, almost islands of trash. That's what's happening. So we know that plastic has become quite an issue. Doug talked about it a little bit last week as we talked about birds. Um, the ocean pla is receiving a lot of the plastics. The molecules of plastic we talk about, sometimes it can be recycled, but it's being recycled into more plastic. So every bit of plastic that's ever been created since the 1950s is still here on the planet. It can't, you know, you throw it away into the landfill, but plastic doesn't biodegrade. And a lot of times it gets washed uh, for a variety of reasons into the oceans. So this um, gentleman, he pulled around a giant net and collected plastic. What happens is it just breaks down into smaller and finer pieces. So what he's got in the jar there are all little tiny bits of plastic. And now what we're finding is that plastic is even, um, they call it the microplastics. They're in, inside of most all fish at this point, um, and they are inside of us as well. So 368 million tons of plastic are produced, only 91% or excuse me, only 9% of what's created is recycled into something else usable. Um, and it's estimated that by 2050, the ocean will contain by weight more plastic than fish. So you have a, a five pound fish and then for how much of that you also have plastics. So these kinds of research are going on and the annual pl production in plastics is still going up. Um, looks like we're leveling off at a certain amount here. I don't know exactly why. I mean, plastics seem to be in everything, everywhere. Um, and then it ends up like this. So on the beaches, um, this is a particular beach, the beach at Munkar on the island of Java just covered in plastics. The 400 yard wide, mile long stretch of sand was several feet deep in foul smelling sauce packets, shopping bags, diapers, bottles, plastic clothes, and detergent bottles. Bulldozers had cleared away and buried some of the huge mat of plastic and sand two years ago, but every tide since then washed up more rubbish from the ocean and every day, tons more plastic was washed down the rivers from the upstream towns and villages, and now it is fouling the fishing boat propellers so they're not able to go out and get their food. 
So there is a, an organization called Project Stop that has empowered people and created change toward reducing the plastic problem. So last year at this time, I was in Galveston, Texas, and just walking the beach there, and they have trash cans. It's really close. It's like every probably 50 yards, there's a trash can on the beach, and then the trash truck drives along and comes and dumps those um, every day or every other day. And as I walked along that beach, just the amount of plastics, plastic spoons, you know, like they said, the sauce packets, all these different kinds of plastics. Um, and the trash cans are right there. But I seem to be the only one that was noticing. Lots of people were walking their dogs. I'm certainly not saying I was better than those people, but I thought it was interesting that I seemed to be the only one picking up the trash that was there, uh, even when garbage cans were so easily accessible. So I wonder, started to really feel a lot more connected to this problem. And it's not just the people that are affected by it. How many of you attended the extra credit movie, Albatross, last week? Okay. So here is a, here is a snapshot from that movie. And I really encourage you, don't look away. Really take this in. It's hard but I think it's important. Do we have the courage to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future? journey through the eye of beauty. Across an ocean of grief.
and beyond. words that he chooses there, do we have the courage to face the stories of our time? The beached whale on the California coast with 400 pounds of plastic in its belly. So plastic has become what we know. It's what we use all the time. How can we change this big story, right? There are things that we use plastic for that, that now have become just plastic. Nothing, you know, no other solutions have been found um, to some of the conveniences and some of the, what we consider needs of our time. And so it's a huge, huge challenge and I, I ask that you reflect on your plastic choices, um, see how we can make a difference. And it's not just plastic that we're facing in the oceans. There is long line fishing, and I'm not trashing fishing, there is a way to do it, and then there are other ways to do it. It has evolved in the name of efficiency, which if we consider most of our plastic usage, that's true there too, efficiency and ease. So some of these long lines can be 50 miles long. How many things can they catch on those thousands of hooks? I learned from Sylvia Earle that uh, a lot of what they catch on the line might be creatures that are caught by accident. It's not the things that they're intending to catch but it's the extra stuff. Um, trawling is another fishing technique where they drag a net along the bottom of the ocean floor and see what they can scoop up. Uh, it happens on the continental shelf. Uh, you can see the results of bo bottom trawling uh, from space. This is, those are the trawling lines where they have dug up the entire bottom of the ocean. Stirs up these billowing plumes of sediment that can be seen from so far away. They are scooping up the entire ecosystems on the sea floor. So what are they getting, right? Before it might be this kind of vivid life that you see on the left and afterward they're there's pretty much nothing remaining. These bottom trawlers, super trawlers, are now a thing. They're lar large enough to hold 13 jumbo jets, and they are currently working in waters all over the world. So it's the choices, right? The choices that we're making. So what do they catch in here? They're catching everything. Everything. They call it bycatch when they catch something that they don't expect or don't, you know, weren't expecting to catch. So if they were going for fish like this, in that pile of fish uh, might also be sea turtles and might also be whales and dolphins, sharks. Um, so all of it is just a story of disconnect, right? It, it started as getting what we need, and now with nearly eight billion people on the planet, the needs are so much more. If a baby dolphin is caught in the net, likely the mother will also die because she stays with that baby under the water. Species extinctions have gone up at a pretty alarming rate in the last, uh, last hundred years, and even more so in the last 40 years or so. Sylvia Earle told me that 90% of the big fish are gone. So she says, we can be the saviors of humankind. I say humankind because life will go on with or without us. 
It did before and it can after. It just won't be the same assemblage of life. We're already altering the pieces of the puzzle. We've lost a lot of species due to our actions. When we destroy a coral reef, we lose its residents, all the unique species that evolved there and nowhere else in the universe. For example, some species of lizard fish have a very limited range. Shrimp-like creatures called stomapods have unique eyes that see a much broader spectrum of light than humans can, the broadest spectrum we've been able to identify in any creature. So we destroy the reef and we lose that piece of the puzzle and we'll never have a complete picture again. So we talked about the birds a little bit, what's going on with the birds. There are the amphibians and the reptiles, the mammals, the insects. So these things are on the decline. But what I do know is, Doug didn't reference this the other day, is that grassland species of birds their numbers are actually improving because people did something. They saw what was happening. They changed their land use. They changed the seasons of when they were tilling and plowing. They changed the way that the laws were written so that it would protect those grassland species of birds. The same thing can happen if we gather around other species like this, this case study of the North Sea Cod. So the North Sea Cod was overfished significantly in the 1970s and 80s, and it got to the point where there were very few of these cod, and that's a very important species of fish that feeds people and other fish. They were pulling out about 60% of the cod out of the water each year in the North Sea. So if they're pulling out 60%, it doesn't take a math degree to figure out that pretty soon you're on the downside. You're taking more than can be sustainable. So in 2006, the government bought about half of the fishing boats in Scotland and destroyed them. The boats that kept working were put under strict regulations. The number of days they could spend at sea, the number of cod they could catch, and so the story changed. You can see that the cod, then the numbers were going up here. In reading more about this this morning, as I got ready for class today, I learned that when the fishermen and people found out that the numbers of cod were going up, they started taking more again. And now the numbers of cod are back down. So what happens when we make an effort to make change to make things better, to support the world around us, it really can make a big difference. But we have to sustain that stuff. We have to keep it going. So as you look, as you look carefully at these fish, they're individuals, right? We've talked about box turtles and how they know their place. It's very true for these animals of the water too, as uncertain as we are, as I am about it, you know, I, I don't know, I have hesitancy about going deep down in the ocean. But when we do, we can see that the animals that are there are in community. They know their places and spaces and routines and patterns just like the box turtles do, just like we do. It's not commodity, right? It's not a commodity. Fish is often just, they talk about it as stock, right? Just like if you were trading stock. The fish stock has gone up. But what happens if we think about them as something other than big business? What if we think about them as having homes and communities too? Sylvia Earle says a lot of people excuse their bad behavior toward fish by saying, oh, they don't feel pain. She says that's nonsense. Fish have all the equipment that we do to feel pain. Don't make up stories to try to spare your conscience, she says. You either choose to inflict pain on other creatures or you don't. So is there a way that we can see fish and all other creatures 
with new eyes. Take a moment and talk to your neighbor. What are you thinking and feeling, intuiting right now? Anybody have any comments they'd like to share? Thoughts, questions? Alana, there's somebody here in the back row. So we were discussing about, um, first and foremost, that video was really upsetting to watch. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I know that the plastic use is an issue. And when I came to school as a freshman, I was like super into the whole like, you know, go green thing. And then when COVID happened, it kind of took a back seat. And um, it's really upsetting to see images of that. You hear about it, but you don't normally get to see it so vividly. Um, but my thing about the fish is I, I am super interested in the ocean. And I think it's really interesting and cool. But on the other hand, I don't know how to balance my relationship with fish if I also feel that I want to consume them for my own like health, um, because I don't know if being like vegan and you know stopping eating meat is is the solution to that. And I I don't want the only solution to be that way because I feel I get benefits as well from you know eating meat and stuff like that. Yeah, it's tricky, super tricky, and we'll continue to wind our way through this, right? So that hopefully you can come to an answer that's right for you. Right? Yes, other thoughts? I appreciate you bringing all of that up. So some of you spoke um, about this, about loving the ocean. James T. Farrell of St. Olaf College defines love as this. You want to be physically near it. You can think about, as you go through this, not just the ocean, but things that you love, right? People that you love, places that you love. You want to be physically near it. You want the best for it all the time. You fear its loss and grieve for its injuries. You want to know everything about it, its story, its moods, and what it looks like by moonlight. It's a little bit of the mystery of love, right? You want to protect it fiercely and helpless to do otherwise. And those, those were the five that he came up with. And I think that I feel very compelled to add one to this list. I want to be my best for it. So if I'm thinking about the love of my family, I want to be the best, my best for it. If I even think about the love of myself, I want to show up for me, right? If I think about my love of my pets, of my yard, of my, the places I've traveled, I want to treat those things in the best way possible, to the most balanced way and most capacity that I can. So how can we be our best for the oceans? Right? What does that love look like? 
I know I've talked about her a lot. I obviously like Sylvia Earle. She created this organization at, called Mission Blue, and you can watch the Netflix documentary about this. We, don't, we are not deliberately trying to hurt the ocean, right? But we are, we have, out of ignorance, out of greed, out of need. So while 12% of the land is protected, 12% um, is in some form of protection of land, there is less than 6% of the ocean that's protected. So Sylvia Earle created what she calls hope spots and anyone can apply to name a certain place a hope spot. It's protected areas of the ocean, sites that give us hope, sites that we can't ignore because their conservation is going to be vital. So leaders and policymakers need to be aware of these protected spaces. So the movie is pretty inspirational. You might want to check it out. With every breath you take, the ocean assists you wherever you are, even if you've never seen it. You never see your heart either, but it's working for you. So this week for your pack back question, your pack back prompt for this week is why care? Thinking about the birds, thinking about the oceans, thinking about all of the connections. Why care? I hope that you enjoy this beautiful day.